morning, church. Good to be together again, and hopefully everyone had a great 4th of July. Welcome to the Rappahannock campus of the Potomac Valley Church. As my wife uh, introduced us already, my name is Kai, and um, welcome to the Rappahannock campus. We've been studying out grace, and it has been an incredible journey to, to study out grace together as we have been following the Holy Spirit together. And uh, so we're starting this new series called Grace Applied, Seven Stories of Generosity, as we look at how these parables intersect with God's grace and what God teaches us about generosity. And, uh, and, and speaking of generosity, our lead evangelist last week spoke about we're giving away gift cards as a show of generosity. So under your seats, there should be three gift cards among us. So under your seats should be some gift cards, two to Walmart and one to Costco. So once I said Walmart, everyone. So we're going to be doing this every week. Uh, and by the way, these gift cards aren't for personal use. Okay? Uh, this is Grace Applied. So uh, we're, we're talking about grace, God's grace and generosity. So what we want you guys to do with the gift card is... Offer acts of kindness. Offer acts of generosity. Amen. You can use that money to have somebody over. You can use that money to buy someone dinner or lunch or breakfast or a gift. Use that money in a way that shows, one, God's generosity and, of course, God's grace as well. But what, we, what we would like, though, is as you guys are perhaps um, having lunch or giving away a gift to sh share or record a 30-second video recording of this act of generosity and act of kindness and post it on social media and hashtag grace supply. Amen? So we're going to be doing this every week. So there's many more gift cards for the next six weeks. Today is the first week. So the next six weeks, we're going to continue to have a gift card. So grace supply. If you have a Bible, we're going to look at the prodigal son this morning as uh, we're looking at how grace Generosity intersect with really God's heart. I also want to mention that uh, we have Ian, our, our beloved Ian Watson here and his family. He's our, our international missionary back stateside for a couple of weeks, uh, but really, really amazed and inspired by all the work you're doing over there in Europe and overseas. So really, really proud of you, Ian. And he is our own local Stafford resident. So he is from Stafford and uh, grateful to for him to be here and his family here as well. So uh, today we read one of the greatest stories of God's grace in the Bible, the prodigal son. And we call this message Prodigal Grace. Prodigal Grace. And the key to understanding God's grace and God's generosity in this passage is to find yourself in this passage. Here we read about this father who has two sons that share the stage with him. One is older, one is younger, one is religious, one is rebellious, one has sins that he struggles with that are very obvious, and one has sins that he struggles with that are not so obvious. And so God is the father, and he is gracious to those who sin outwardly, like the prodigal son, and God is the father who is gracious to those who sin inwardly, like the older son. Let's read the passage together in verse 11. And I love this parable. This is probably my favorite parable in, uh, of Jesus' teachings here. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 15, verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, he, now and after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he gave to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare in here and starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. 
Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill him. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive, and yet he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now we meet the older brother. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fat calf because he hasn't made the back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fat calf for him. My son, the father said, You're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We stop there. This is an incredible passage. We have the father who is really, I would argue, the main character. And in this stage, he shares this story with his two sons. One is older, one is younger. Yeah. One who has incredible sin that is very obvious. One that has incredible sin that is not so obvious. One that is very much liberal in how he lives his life, and one perhaps that is more traditional in how he lives his life. Verse 11 says, there was a man who had two sons. First we meet the father. Is he a good dad or is he a bad dad? <coughs> He's a good dad. He's a great dad. And, and, and this is obviously God the Father. And I need you to understand as we read this passage and as we break down this passage, how incredible God the Father really is. I have everything in my life because of how good God is. Of course, God imbued me and imbued you with many talents, abilities, and skills. Maybe you were blessed to have been born into a great family, regardless of your family background, regardless of your race, your gender, your ethnicity. Everything you have is from God. The fact that you have life and breath is God's grace. If you are married, if you have children, that is such a blessing from God. So many people want to be parents or are unable to be parents. Everything is God's gift. Both of my family, both sides of my family, both sides of my wife's family, it is so dysfunctional. There's so much sin. There's so much adultery. There, there, there are criminals. There are people that are living in there that are spending their time in jail. There are people with records. Uh, there are people that, that have hurt people. There's unforgiveness. There's dysfunction. Everything that I have is from God. The fact that my wife and I, not only do we get along, but we love each other. We love our kids. It is from God. It's not because of how great I am or my wife is or how, how, how great our personalities are. It's because of Jesus. It's because of God. God the Father has been good to me. And it's awesome that when Jesus tells us to pray, what does he say? He says, when you pray, pray to God, Abba, Father. And the Bible says that God is a Father who loves us, who protects us, who's generous with us, who's gracious to us, who shepherds us. Even the good that happens, it's really to discipline us and to teach us if we're patient and if we learn from it. God is good to all of us. Yeah. Right. And it's sometimes hard to see that. Yeah. If you're going through a lot, you can draw the conclusion that your circumstances are really a reflection of how God feels about you. That God is punishing you because of your sin. God is punishing you because of what you did or did not do. But God is always good. Yeah. And God is good to us. God is gracious to us. I need you to see that God is a loving, gracious Father in this parable. And all throughout this parable. Because we first now meet the first son. And what does he want? He wants his inheritance. And he wants it now. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divides the property between them. And here... He dishonors, he disrespects, and he disobeys his father. Yeah. He dishonors his father because he wants his inheritance now. And it can be common, I guess, in those times. But you generally don't get your inheritance until the father passes away. Yeah, right. So he's basically saying, hey, dad, you're not going to pass away anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, but I want my inheritance now. It would have been an unwritten divorce from the father. It's basically like, dad, I, I really would like for you to go now. So I can have my inheritance now. It's akin to saying, I wish you were dead. Yeah. Imagine telling your good father, 
I don't want you, I want your wealth. Yeah. As a parent, imagine if your parent, if your child told you, I don't want you, I don't want a relationship with you, but I want what you can provide me. Correct. And that's what he wants. What the father can give him. And so the father here, in those times, and I guess even these times today, he is being embarrassed, yeah. he's being humiliated, yeah. he's being dishonored. And this would be, by all intents, he would be dead to the family because he's saying to the father, you're dead to me. Yeah. He's been under the protection of the father's house this whole time, but he thinks life is better outside of the father's house. Right. Even in our lives, sometimes we look at the world and we look at those who don't worship God and don't believe in Jesus, and we think, man, they have it so good yeah. that somehow life maybe is better outside of the father's house. And we think like this prodigal son, but you know where it begins? It begins with the heart of ingratitude and entitlement. And that's where the drifting away starts, a heart of ingratitude. All the things I've shared about how good God has blessed my life, I want my kids to know that. I want my children to know that everything we have is because God has been good to us. They, they, I want them to grow up knowing that everything we have is from God. So that they don't have a sense of entitlement. Amen. So that they can have a deep appreciation, not for us, but for God. Yeah. Okay. To know that every little gift, this house that we have, the jobs that we have, the toys that you have, the food that we eat, that all because of how good God has been. That's right. God is so good. Otherwise, I don't, I don't want my kids to grow up like this kid. So what does he do? He he leaves the father's house. So what does the father do? He refinances things, gives him the keys to the car, gives him an inheritance, and he goes away to squander all of his wealth and what the Bible says, wild living. He acts out selfishly by partying, squandering his inheritance. Verse 13, he says, younger son got together all he had. Now he's divorced from his dad. He set off for a distant country. Squandered his wealth and wild living. So he turns his back on God, the good father, turns his head towards a tremendous season of outward and obvious sin, indulgence. And for some of you, this is where you're headed. You want to leave the father's house so you can kind of live how you want to. For some of you, your rebellion and your sin has begun already, but it's not so obvious. You may say amen to this message this morning, but... You're cursing out or yelling out your spouse and kids the previous night. Yep, yep. You may be living a, a, a sinful lifestyle, but still under the protection of God's house. But you know your heart. God knows your heart, and you know your lifestyle. Yeah. COVID and the pandemic, it, it may have given us, uh, given us a license to do whatever we want right. outside of the structures that we were used to. Right. When we didn't meet for so long, when everything was online for so long, and we were just in our homes... And it really exposed where we were with God when you remove the traditional structures of we're not meeting in person anymore. Right. We're not meeting together anymore. Mm -hmm. We're not spending time with each other anymore. And all those things were difficult for sure. But what were you doing during that time? How was family life during that time? Okay. How was parenting during that time? How was your purity during that time? Okay. These are real things. Because your name might be on the membership list, but not on the book of life. Okay. And the question you should ask is, what is the Father's heart towards me? Because many of us, like me, we've been taught wrongly that if you act good, then God will love you. Right, right. Growing up, my family taught me that my worth was derived from school and from success and from money. And when I became a Christian, then it, it became... My, my worth came from the amount of baptisms or the people that came to church or the numbers and stats in, in the ministry. But it's led me to a greater place of insecurity and a greater place of arrogance and competition that was just as worse as the sins of this prodigal son. But then, you and I know, sin has a shelf life. It has an expiration date. Verse 14, he spent everything he had. But then there was a severe famine. He began to be in need. He had hit rock bottom so bad, he went out and hired himself out to a citizen in that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And this is where it got so bad. <coughs> he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. 
He had it, he thought he had it so good, having all of his wealth, having all of his inheritance, and now he thinks the pigs have it better than he does. Sin has a shelf life. Seasons of sin has an expiration date. And really often our plan is to, plan A is to rebel, to party, to squander. Plan B is damage control, mitigate sin's consequences. Sometimes we do this by moving away, moving to a new church or a new Bible talk or a new ministry. But our, our habits follow us right. and our sins follow us. Right. You know, we enter one romantic relationship and it, and it doesn't go well, so we enter a different one. We, we change partners or we remarry or we change our life stage. We think everything's going to change when we have kids or we think everything's going to change when we get married or we think everything's going to change when we retire or we think everything's going to change once the bills are paid. But no, like you are who you are regardless of where you are, regardless of what your bank account looks like, regardless of how many kids you have or whether or not you have kids. You are who you are. But here, he hits rock bottom. He hits rock bottom. And the prodigal son is a really a vivid picture of our sin and the consequences of sin. So when he realizes he hit rock bottom, he can't survive on his own, what does he do? He, I want to go back to God. I want to go back to the good father. I want to go back to the good father. He comes to his senses in verse 17. I love that idea. Like he comes to his senses. In other words, like it was all kind of unclear, but now it's become clear. How many times, like when we hit rock bottom or when our sin gets to us and we realize the depth and the magnitude of our sin, what once used to be so cloudy and so unclear becomes so clarified. Right. 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 He comes to his senses and he says, my father's servants have food to spare and I'm here starving to death, wishing to eat what the pigs were eating. He has this bright idea. I'm going to go back to my father, say to him, I've sinned against heaven and against you. He is no longer coming back to be a son, but to simply be a servant. I mean, I mean. He went, and so he goes, he goes back to his father, verse 20. And his, back, his path back to the father, I would think, is what I would call repentance. It's a change of worldview. Yes. He realizes, he comes to this conclusion that the father I was trying to run away from, that I thought was disciplining me, that was strict, that was traditional, that was hard, that was harsh, he was loving and protective the whole time. Right. And I failed to see it. And I didn't see it. And now I see it. It's become so clear to me. I had it so good yeah. with the gracious Father. He was so gracious to me. He was so merciful to me. I had it good with God. And the journey back home would have been a lot harder than the journey to go away. Yeah. Because he had money to go away. <clears throat> he had no money to return. Hey. He had no more resources to return. Yeah. Now, how does the father respond to the younger son in this parable? And I want to ask you, how would you respond? Yeah. Would you be upset? Would you be angry? Bro. Would you be like, hey, I told you so? Bro. Would you be would you hold his nose to his sin? Uh, yeah. <laughs> would you show him his past mistakes? Yeah. Would you make him feel guilt and shame and yeah. bad for the choices that he made? Yeah. I think that's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably what all of us would do. Yeah. But what he doesn't do, he doesn't disown the son. There is no frustration. There is no anger. He doesn't cast him away. He's yeah. not done. You need to know, no matter how much you have sinned in your past, in the pandemic, yeah. and now God is not done with you. Like Candace shared, you are more than a conqueror. Yes. We are powerful. Yeah. You can choose to be a victim, or you can choose to take responsibility. We are powerful beyond measure. And here, right here, I need you to know, God's not done with you. You need to know that you may be in a place of incredible sin. You may have committed some egregious sins according to you. God sees all of it the same, secret or public, private or public, all sin is the same, and God's not done with you. He doesn't want to cast you aside. He doesn't want to throw you away. He loves you, cares for you, waiting to embrace you, to accept you. Because what happens? It says, while well, he was a long way off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His father saw him. 
was filled with compassion for him. Ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The Bible says that the father saw his son a long way off. Almost like this father had been waiting every day. Is my son coming home? Is my son coming home? Yeah. When's my son coming back? Yeah. I know he's going to come back. Is my son coming home? He wanted to see his son's return. The Bible says the father ran to him. Running is for children and servants back in those days. That's right. Grown men didn't run. Right. See, God is slow to anger, quick to forgive. Yes. But the good father ran because he couldn't contain, contain his affections. Because he didn't want to spend another moment, another second, apart from the son yeah. he loves. For those who are here, and you call yourself a Christian, and you're involved in a lot of sin, and if you are here and you don't call yourself a Christian, but you're involved in a lot of sin, you need to know that if you turn towards God the Father, He won't be there to shake your hand. He won't be there to accept you. He won't be there just to be there and tell you, I told you so. He will run to you. He will run to you. All you gotta do is turn your face towards Him. All you gotta do is turn towards Him. And God will more than meet you in the middle. He will meet you where you are. He will run to where you are. And the son came prepared to kiss the father's feet. But what happens? The father kisses him instead. All you need to do is turn toward the father and he will run toward you. And he will do what he does in the story to you. He will kiss you. He will laugh with you. He will smile. He will cheer. He will embrace. He will bless. He will honor. He will cherish. God cannot love you any more than he already does. God cannot love you any more than He already does. There's nothing that you can do that will make Him love you less. There's nothing you can do that will make Him love you more. It's not about what you have done. It's not about your performance. It's about all of His affections. And the Son says to Him, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your Son. He's probably rehearsed this already this whole time. You know, if, if, if... if you're going to come to, to, to own up to your sin, you probably rehearse it in your mind of what you're going to say and perhaps how the other party is going to respond. So he's resolved to no longer be a son, but just simply be a servant. Yeah. He comes to the realization that he has nothing. Yes. He once had an inheritance, but he had nothing. You and I need to know, when we come to God, we come to God with nothing. Yes. We don't come to God with our GPA, on, with our good works, with our political understanding, bro. with our uh, bachelor's degree, GED, high school diploma, yeah. master's yeah. degree, yeah. dissertation, MD, JD, any of that. We come to God with nothing. You might be the highest rank in your um, unit. You might be in charge of some people in your job. You might be CEO or CFO, or you might have influence and authority over many people, yeah. but when you come to God, we all come to God the same, yeah. with nothing. Yeah. You might be the leader of the church, you might count money, you might be the head usher, right. you might be the head worship leader, but at the foot of the cross, we are all the same. Right. We come to God with a nothing, empty-handed, everything is given to us by God, and His first instinct pay off his debt. But what does God say? <clears throat> You're not going to work harder. You're not going to try more. That's right. You're not going to earn favor. God's not going to make you try harder, do more, be better. He forgives. Yeah. And the father had perceived his son's repentance simply by the fact that he returned home. Because yes. he knows his son. He knows his son's heart. And what does he do? He's generous. Father said to servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fat calf and kill it. God is generous. He gives him sandals, which would have been the gift of sonship. He gives him a robe, which would have been the gift of honor. He gives him a ring, which is the gift of authority. You see, God, what he does, and I love this, he takes our worst and gives us his best. I mean, this son had been squandering his wealth. He took a week, he had a divorce from his father. He left his father, estranged from his family. And according to the older brother, I don't know how true this is, maybe the older brother was exaggerating, he squandered his wealth with prostitutes and wild living. I mean, this guy was bad. I mean, he's, he's really bad. Really bad. And the father just forgives and restores him. There are no second-class Christians. That's 
right. God's kingdom. That's right. It doesn't matter if you've drifted from God and returned to God. It doesn't matter if you've committed one of the top ten sins, yeah. ten commandments. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you've been caught. It doesn't matter if you've been exposed. Or it doesn't matter if you've exposed yourself. It doesn't matter if you've been uh, traumatized by some of the things that the church has done. It doesn't matter if you have religious dysfunction and trauma from the past. There are no second-class Christians. It doesn't matter if you've served in the ministry and was let go. It doesn't matter if you've never served in the ministry and have never been considered for the work of the ministry, paid ministry. There are no second-class Christians. We are all the same because we are all sinners. We're all messed up people, and we all are poor beggars, but we know where food is. That's right. Yeah. Where Jesus is the bread of life. That's right. And so, God is generous. He has no second class children. What perfect parent compares their children? Who does my Heavenly Father compare me to? Nobody. And if God doesn't compare me with anybody, then I should compare myself with anybody. Oh. There are no second-class Christians. He, he's not going to make you try harder, do better, earn favor. He's always, always, always going to start with love, affection, and grace. And they have a party. There's a celebration. Yeah. That's the younger son. His sins were so obvious. He left God. Took his inheritance and squandered all of it. And then you got the older son. He stayed with the father. He didn't take his inheritance. And while the older son didn't disrespect the father, it also seemed like he didn't have the greatest relationship with the father either. Correct. You see, you might be outwardly sinning against God, but that doesn't mean that you might not be outwardly sinning against God, but that doesn't mean that you have a relationship with God. Correct. See, you might not never have left the father's house, but that doesn't mean you have a relationship with the Father. Yeah. 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 I talk a lot about COVID-19 and the pandemic. And yeah. we have we know the faces of those who are no longer here yeah. because of what COVID-19 exposed. Right. But then there are people that have never left, that have never left church, have always been coming, have been faithful in coming to church, but also COVID-19 exposed that you also didn't have a relationship with the Father. Correct. Even though you never left the Father's house. Yes. Because this older son, deep down, he was bitter towards the Father's grace. Yep, yep. He was bitter towards his love. Okay. And he also didn't seem to have a relationship with the Father. He was equally dishonoring the Father by refusing to go to his brother's party. Right. And as we examine it closer, it looks like the older son was also involved in a lot of sin, just not so obvious. That's right. Because he was equally lost. He was equally estranged from the father. He was equally sinful as the younger son. And the older brother needed as much forgiveness from the father as the younger brother. Yes. But he wasn't self-aware. Yeah. Because if he was self-aware, he would have celebrated. Yeah. And here the older son standing outside was really an expression of his rebellion, of his defiance. Here's what the older brother says. He becomes angry, refused to go in, verse 28. So what does God do? He goes out and pleads with him. And he answers his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, you know he's mad. He says, not my brother, but the son of yours, right? Parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? Your daughter, your son, not our daughter, our son, right? When this son of yours has squatted your property when prostitutes comes home, you kill the fat calf for him. So why did the older son leave if it was that bad? Why didn't he leave like the younger son, the prodigal son? If life in the father's house was so hard, he was the firstborn. Which means he stood to inherit the most. Mm. He wouldn't want to forfeit all that for a cash out. So his attitude was the same as the father, as, as the as the younger, as the prodigal son. Right? He wished he was dead as well. But it was so. Purposely calls him this son of yours instead of my brother. 
And his self-assessment was, I've never sinned, like the rich young ruler. His approach, I think, is even more insulting because it's, it's uh, passive-aggressive. It's more insulting than prodigal son because he's insinuating that the good father needs his forgiveness. Correct. He says, this is not fair. And I want you to really get this about God's grace. Grace is not fair. That's right. Right. That's God right. is not about fair, but he's about grace. That's right. The wages of sin is death. 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 So what is fair? We want to talk about justice. Yeah. We want to talk about right and wrong. Yeah. God is the Father has been hurt this whole time. Right. When you and I sin, we hurt God the Father. That's right. Whether it's a lie or adultery, something public and shameful, or something secret and private, it all hurts God nonetheless. That's right. And the wages of sin is death, which means that what's fair is that we all die, we all go to hell. Right. Nobody gets to heaven. Right. So I'm glad that God doesn't work from the, the standards of faith. Yeah. He works from the standards of grace. That's right. Come on. Wow. And so that means that we all deserve hell. Everything else is a gift from God. Right. Everything is a gift from God. I got a job. That is a gift from God. Right. I got a spouse. I got kids. That's a gift from God. I can pay my bills. That's a gift from God. I've got food in the fridge. That's a gift from God. I've got my health. That's a gift from God. The fact that I've got a retirement plan, a 401k, that's a gift from God. Yeah. The fact that I can walk to church or drive to church or make it to church, you know, that's a gift from God. There are places, there are places outside of this country where people can't get to church. Yeah. Right. The fact that we can be here in an air-conditioned room, this is recorded for others to see, it's a gift from God. Yeah, I'm glad that God is not fair because how do you see you respond to the Older son, equally gracious and loving. Yes. Yep. He says, my son, verse 31, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we got to celebrate and be glad. Yeah. Because this brother is yours was dead and is alive. He's lost and is found. And the father makes the proposal of peace to the old brother. And I love because because the father, the Bible says, he was pleading, pleading with the older son. Right. God seeks us out. Yes. The Bible says that Jesus is the author, perfect of our faith. He starts salvation, he completes it. Yeah. Before we even sought God out, God was seeking us out. Yeah. Before we had an interest in loving God and having a relationship with God, God sought us out. God seeks us out. He is the initiator. Fathers didn't plead in that culture. It would have been embarrassing. But he pleads with his older brother because he is loving, he is gracious, yeah. he is merciful, he is compassionate. And he responds with love. He loves all of his children the same. There are no second class Christians in God's kingdom. We all have the same rights and privileges. God doesn't compare you with anyone. We don't have to compete and fight with others for God's blessings. He has an unlimited supply. He's generous with grace. You know, when, uh, when, I, when, when I take the kids to go get a toy or something. I always tell them, I always set the boundaries for them, right? If we go to the grocery store, sometimes I tell them, no toys today, we're just getting groceries. <laughs> <laughs> and there are times where, all right, we're going to go out and get you a toy, but only one toy, right? There are boundaries, because my generosity has limits. God's generosity has no limits. It's not like he can bless you, but not the other person. He can bless all of us. Yeah. He can love all of us. Right. He can give you a million toys. Right? Because he has, a, he has an unlimited credit of grace. And God offers grace to the prodigal sons and daughters out there. God offers grace to the legalists out there, the older sons and daughters out there. God offers grace to those who have left the Father's house. God offers grace to those who have never left the Father's house. God offers grace to all of us, and the story really ends kind of abruptly, without much conclusion, resolution. It leaves us with shock and wonder and incompleteness, and kind of on a cliffhanger. Because I believe we're meant to finish the story with our lives. That's right. We're meant to write our own response to God's grace. 
Will we be rebellious like the younger son? Or will we be legalistic like the older son? How will you respond to God the Father's incredible grace? I want to end out here with these discussion questions for us to discuss in groups here. Some quick questions. Do you relate more to the older or the younger brother in line? What do you believe about God's reaction to your mistakes, failures, and sins? Do you draw near to Him or stay away until you can clean up your act? What does this passage teach you about God's grace? And lastly, how can you have more grace on yourself this week? Let's break up in groups of three or four and discuss this, uh, and then our singers will close us out with a song.